pieces of software. It's an AI platform. And most of you will have heard of IBM's platform, Watson, but many of the big companies now have their own. Like, in some sense, Siri is an AI platform. In some sense, Google Search is. But in any case, there's a whole bunch of these, Erica. They have names. Many, many of them have names. Few of them have as presentational uh, avatar as, as Amelia does. But it was used, uh, one of its first usage was helping people open up bank accounts in Sweden for the Swedish bank SEB. This was a couple years ago when I was doing my research. Um, and uh, in the advanced versions, it has facial recognition. So if you have a high-end smartphone in Sweden and you connect to your bank, Amelia recognizes you, knows every, all the exchange you've had before, and you have a conversation going forward like, uh, I'm still having a trouble reconciling this or whatever, and she can do a lot of stuff. And if she can't do it, she kicks it over to a real human. But she does uh, many, many things. Now, um, Amelia plays a big role in my book. It's a, it's a book that I'm meant to be popular, so I tell a lot of stories. And Amelia is a great vehicle for storytelling. And so she's in the beginning of the book, the middle of the book, the end of the book. And if I forget to tell you the story of Amelia and Amanda, remind me at the end of the lecture, okay? So that is actually Amanda. That's a, a model who modeled for the avatar, uh, but of course they call it Amelia, and it's a good story. Okay, does that teaser keep you to the end of the lecture? <laughs> All right. So, some of you, I think I'm doing pretty good tonight, but a lot of times I start seeing the eyes rolling, it's like, uh, old wine, new bottles, you know, we've heard about this stuff, he invented a few new words to sell a few books, but it's nothing new. And, and the books are for sale. <laughs> but um, when I was doing the research for this book, and it's why it's not just about the future of globalization, I came across what I felt was a very systematic misthinking of the future of work, both on the globalization and the automation side. And to help me understand why this time is different, I constructed a couple little pieces of intellectual infrastructure. And that's what I want to share with you, the misthinking, trying to rethink the misthinking, if that makes any sense, uh, and why this time is really different, why I've convinced myself that this time is really different. So the first thing that's really different is it's affecting service and professional jobs, not just factory jobs. These people, know all about competing with China abroad and robots at home. You can't teach them anything about Globotics. They know all about it. They've been living it for the last 25 years. Those people feel sorry for these people when they lose their job. But most of them have never competed directly with foreigners. In you know, a few sectors like finance or professors and things like that, there is a global market. But the vast majority of people in the service sector do not compete with foreigners because traded services are considered non-traded, at least many of them. And they've never seen automation. There was some computerization in the 70s and 80s and stuff, but for the most part, computers couldn't think. So any service that required human thinking was not automatable. So these people are not used to or anticipating automation. So that makes a big difference. Office and professional workers are different. First of all, there's a lot of them. All the discussion about globalization and automation, almost all of it, much of it, is couched in the terms of manufacturing or some sort of extractive industry. Almost all of it. Because that's what it was the last 25 years or last 200 years. This time, it's going to be very, very different. And therefore, it's going to be affecting a much larger share of the population. So in the United States, for example, there's 140 million jobs, more or less. Nine million of them are in factories. And a good share of those nine million are not factory workers in the sense you have in mind. They are people looking after the robots who are making this stuff. So if you're thinking about globalization the next 10 years, like it was the last 20 years, you have the wrong industry in mind. It's not manufacturing, it's gonna be services. Second, and this is good, service sector workers are more flexible and easier to re-employ. Because ser most service sector jobs require a broader skill set 
and the skills in any kind of services are at least somewhat overlapping. So you don't find the guy, situation where a guy's been working in 15 years in a factory, factory closes and he doesn't really know how to do anything else. Because if you work in a service sector, you go to meetings, you read emails, you talk on the phone, and that can be moved around. Moreover, most service sector workers are in cities. And there are jobs in cities. So that's the good thing. It's not like a factory remotely is closed and then what do people do? But lastly, and I mentioned this before, they are not ready for it. And that's what puts the upheaval in my title. I think that there's a reasonable chance that these people will be upset with the next two, three, five years and join forces with those who are upset about the last wave of globalization. And we may get an upheaval or backlash against tech, not migrants, not China. So that I thought, well, that must be obviously true. And I convinced myself that this was really going on. So I went to try and see if I could find a political figure who shared my views. And when I was researching this, there was an early contender in the American presidential campaign named Andrew Yang. Have any of you heard of him? So you should watch his video. His book is called The War on Common People, A War on Average People. It is a little bit more <coughs> exciting than mine. But I was going like, wow, this guy's read my book. In fact, I hadn't written the book yet. But still, the video, if you look at the video, you go like, wow, that's right. And he's on about offshoring service sector jobs and automating service sector jobs. He's, say, he's not talking about uh, manufacturing. Now, Andrew Yang and the Yang Gang, as they call it, is, I've been trying to get his attention. He's not paying attention to me at all. I've been trying to clip robotics into his campaign team. That would sell a few books. But nah, that's not working. But Andrew Yang's theme will be adopted by other Democrats for a very politically expedient reason. Americans and many rich country people are feeling a disease, an unclear, vague, something's wrong, something's changed, it's uncertain. And right now, you have Donald Trump blaming immigrants and China. And this gives you a third scapegoat, technology, which many of us are ready to hate right from the beginning because of the privacy stuff, because they're too big, because they're too rich, because we don't understand it. And that's the way these backlashes often happen. It's not just one thing. It's a whole bunch of things come together. And that's why, if we have an upheaval, I think it will be more or less an anti-tech sort of thing. OK, so uh, number two, Digitech is ICT but. So ICT is just information and communication technology. So when I was doing the research for my 2016 book in 2014, 2015, everybody was talking about ICT, information communication technology, Moore's Law, all that sort of stuff. And uh, this time, I started reading in uh, 2018, and everybody was talking about Digitech, digital technology. And I go, well, what's the difference between these things? The answer is nothing. It's about storing, gathering, processing and transmitting data. That's what it is about. But they've given it another name because its effect is going to be very different, or at least I believe. So here, ICT was applied, at least in terms of the world of work, mostly to manufacturing. So we had a situation where you were in a sector which was mostly physical, with a little bit of I and a little bit of C. And ICT, in, in my view, that's my last book, really changed the world. It enabled outsourcing of jobs, and you could coordinate a factory across a big international supply chain. So it was critical, but still, you had to build stuff. Digitech is applied to services, which is mostly information and communication, and only a little bit of physics, uh, physical. So what that means is a different physics applies. ICT was about manufacturing, mining, agriculture, which is constrained by the laws of matter. Services are constrained more by the laws of electrons. So if you're thinking the future of globalization is going to proceed somewhat like it did in the past, you're using the wrong physics. So just to make that point a little bit more clearly, Think about how long it takes to double the flow of imports and exports. 
it takes, at the current pace, about two decades to double imports and exports. Because you have to build twice as many ports. You need to have twice as much transportation capacity. You have to have twice as many factories. You have to build customer bases. These are things that take time. And they are not in our model. But when we think instinctively of how fast things can change, the laws of matter are in the background. Things can't change that fast. Now, the flows of information crossing borders have doubled every two years for the last 10 years, and probably will double every two years for the next 10 years. So if you're thinking the world of services, which is governed mostly by the laws of electronics, is going to turn out very much and at the same pace as imports and exports. You're just using the wrong physics, and it's going to make you uh, somewhat surprised when it comes. Number three, today's AI is different. In 2019, computers can read, write, see, speak, understand speech, create visual output, and recognize subtle patterns. In 2015, they couldn't. So what changed? The answer I would propose is the programming is different. So the way I want to tell you to explain this is by going with this book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. So have everybody, anybody heard of this book? So if you haven't read this book, it's really insightful. I mean, you can, it's, it's, uh, even though he's a Nobel Prize in economics, he writes extremely well. But that's because he's a psychologist. And we were all in, in the profession, we were burned up about this. There aren't that many Nobel Prizes, and they give one of them to a psychologist. <laughs> but in any case, what he did was take very well-known stuff in psychology, which is we have two ways of thinking. The psychologists call it poetically system one and system two. And Kahneman called it thinking fast and thinking slow, and uh, weaves it into our economic decision-making and behavioral biases and all that. It was really quite revolutionary, deserved the Nobel Prize. But what I want to do is use this idea that we have two ways of thinking to explain why programming changed. So thinking slow is what most of you think of as thinking. It's effortful. It's difficult to, to do two separate things at the same time. And most importantly, you know you're doing it, and you know how you do it. So when you do arithmetic, for example, or drawing, or understanding uh, any kind of analytic problem using logic, you're thinking slow, because you go through step by logical step. So somebody can write a computer program, which is just a set of logical instructions, to teach a computer how to think slow. Anything that we know how we do the thinking, we can turn into a program put it up on a computer, and the computer can do it. So those cognitive capacities appeared in the 70s, and all of us have seen the amazing things computers could do. But there was lots of things they couldn't do. And in fact, it, it was called, there's a paradox in, in artificial intelligence called the Moravax, Moravax paradox, which is that computers were good at the hard stuff, but bad at the easy stuff from a human perspective. So you could teach, even back in the, in the 80s, a computer to beat humans at checkers, but you couldn't teach them to walk or recognize a bird in a photo. Now you can, because they're programming the computers in a different way. It's called machine learning. Machine learning has allowed computers to think fast. So thinking fast is the unconscious, uh, instantaneous, effortless, things you can do and you can multitask. So the uh, example I like to give is, let's suppose you're, you're walking downstairs in the morning, looking at the news, you get a bleep, you go, go to the bleep and you see it's your friend sent you a cat video and you realize it's a cat. Same time you stumble down the stairs, catch yourself while recognizing it's a cat. Now what you've just done is an insanely difficult piece of computation. And if you tried to get somebody to write a computer program to do that, first of all, you'd need a very large computer to do it fast enough for it to happen at the same time. But the key here is you don't know how you did that. You don't know how you caught yourself. You don't know how you 
saw the cat video. So you cannot write a program to do it, and they couldn't do it. But what they're doing now is they're using machine learning. So machine learning, all that is, is you take a great big statistical model, a, a nonlinear model, like, like the models they use to predict the weather, much more successfully in Switzerland than I have in here. But in any case, <laughs> essentially it's a, a model where there's thousands of data points coming in. And they don't have like formula X and formula Y. They just estimate the model on what they saw and what happened. So that's called a structured database where the question is clear and the outcome is clear. And if you can gather a million instances of that, you can estimate a statistical model to make the same guesses. So that's what machine learning is. So you take a million or 10 million photos, some with cats, some with not cats, and you pass it back and forth, estimating this model until you get a statistical fit. And then you take some more photos and you do a test on it, you go back and forth, and finally when it's ready to go out in the wild, you give it any set of pixels and it will guess cat or not, just like that. So in essence, you're writing a computer program because when it's done, it is in a computer, it is a computer program, but nobody knows how it works. You can't tell, like, what was it looking for the cat? It's too complex, too nonlinear to do it. But what it's meant is that computers now have cognitive capacity that they did not have before. Seeing, speaking, recognizing speech, talking, translating, all those things were impossible before, and some of them are useful in the workplace. So since about 2016, a whole set of human tasks which required humans before can now be automated. And many of those tasks were actually gatekeeper tasks. Like you remember the one I said about Swisscom? The only human gate in that was reading the email. Because if somehow or another I had uploaded my request on a web and it was absolutely clear what I wanted, it could have all been done automated even before. But now computers routinely open up emails, decide what it is, and act on it. I don't know if, if you have Outlook, but something flippy started happening in my Outlook. It looks through my emails and puts my hotel reservations into my calendar. Like, what's that? <laughs> and what I really hate is it changes the time zones. And I don't change the time zones on my computer, so Anyways, you don't want to go down there, but I'm very annoyed at it. But it means it's looking through my emails, reading them, and understanding which ones are about, you know, organizing so a soccer game and which ones are about an airplane flight. So that's what really changed. It, this time is different because there's a whole set of human skills that weren't automatable before that are now. So, uh, oh wow, time's flying. Globotics is advancing at an explosive pace. Past transformations were much slower. So I'm gonna go through this bit. I, I, I usually like to linger on this bit, but I'm gonna go a little bit faster with this one. Okay, three photos. Apollo 11 landing on the moon, putting a man on the moon, 1969. How many people saw it on TV? All right. How many have even heard about it? No? Okay. Was it black and white or a color TV? Black and white. See, that's how I can tell whether you're lying or not. <laughs> I saw it too. That was an amazing thing. And in fact, Apollo 11 was guided to the moon and back by one of the largest, most powerful mainframes on Earth at the time. And, you know, I don't know about you, but it was like, how do they do the whole, the whole things are spinning and moving and they got it exactly right and nobody died. It was astounding. Now this is the iPhone 6S, which came out in 2015. It is also a very powerful computer. Do you know how much more powerful this computer is than the mainframe that sent Apollo 11? 120 million times faster. That's amazing. You could send, I mean, 120 million Apollo 11s to the moon and back with your iPhone. Well, it was a little more complicated than that, but the processing speed. But you want to know what's even crazier is this is the iPhone 10, which came out in 2017. Do you know how much faster this is than that one? About two and a half. Now, if you do your math, that means there was more increment in processing speed between 2015 and 2017 than there was between 1969 and 2015. Now, that's amazing. 
But you know what's going to happen this year in the fall? There's going to be a new iPhone 10 that comes out that's twice as fast as that one, which means there will have been four times more progress between 2017 and 2019 than there was between 69 and 2015. So when I say it's explosive and it's coming faster than most people believe, it's because the increments are insane. Now, the growth rate hasn't changed. Actually, Moore's law hasn't changed since Richard Nixon was president. It's the same growth rate, but we humans tend to use increments, not growth rates, and that's why we get it wrong. So let me go through this bit. Um, coming faster than most believe. It's predicted but unpredictable. This happens so regularly that we even have a name for it. They call it digital disruption. So I was trying to figure out how is it that intelligent people paid enormous amounts of money with very intelligent advisors routinely are disrupted by digital. For instance, if you look at the S&P 500, there's a whole range of firms which have been eliminated by digital disruption, especially in retail. And it's not like they didn't know digital technology was coming, but they got disrupted. So I constructed a little model in my mind to understand how humans could understand it's coming but still miss it. And I will assert that humans instinctively think about progress as a straight line. When I mean instinctively, I mean your gut. You're, you're thinking fast. It's not when you take out your spreadsheets and calculators and say how fast it's coming. When you say how likely it is that the trucks in America will all be run by autonomous robots in five years' time, there's too many unknowns. So you instinctively go to looking what happened over the last few years. And you instinctively say the increments over the next five years might be a little bit bigger than they were the last five years. And so you go, nah, not going to happen. That's not like a formal scientific calculation. It's your gut. And humans whose minds evolved to track distance in a walking distance world found linearization of the future pretty useful. But that's not what's happening with digital technology. With digital technology, it looks like this. This is how digital technology actually progresses. That's a constant growth rate curve, an exponential curve. And so digital technology comes out, and the people who are really into it, they get excited, and they go, wow, it's going to shoot off. And then not much happens. And then not much happens. And then people are going like, oh, you're exaggerating, you know, cry wolf, and all that sort of stuff. And then increments get bigger. And since you're growing on the increments, eventually this thing takes off. And you're surprised by how fast it comes. It's what I like to call the holy cow moment. You knew it was changing. You knew it was coming. You just didn't think it would come so fast. Actually, the growth rate didn't change. It's the increments got, that got hallucinatory. And you did not anticipate that the increments could be so big. Because you guys were shocked about the iPhone. I mean, have you not been reading the newspapers about how each generation is twice as fast as the other? But you just didn't do the math of what that meant going back. It's, a, it's an instinctive thing. Please. Just to clarify, what you're talking about is the compounding effect of those increments. So it's, Com by compounding interest, this is a compounding effect of increments. It's exactly compounding interest, exactly that. So you grow the base, and since the growth is on the base, and each, you grow on the grow, and the grow accumulates. So eventually, the, the increments get huge. So that's, what, that's exactly what I meant. And, and in the book, I use the example of, of an interest rate account, uh, interest rate to, to show it. There's like bunches of different ones. You know, you put a rice on each thing and double it. There's lots of, one of my favorite ones, as long as you got me on it, and I don't have time, but anyways. Um, if you take a piece of paper and fold it in half, and then fold it again, how many times would you have to fold it to make it as high as Mount Everest? It's like 64, something like that. Because two to the anything gets extremely big, extremely fast. Now, you probably wouldn't be able to fold it again, but still. OK, coming in for as few expect. Think tasks, not occupations. So AI and RI will change almost every job somewhat, but probably not replace any jobs or very, very few. 
because AI and RI are good at particular things, but most of our jobs require a broader thing, some of which require you to be there, and some of which can't be done by machine learning. So it's like farmers and tractors. The tractor changed the nature of farming, but tractors are not just young farmers waiting for a few more years of evolution and then they'll replace all the farmers. Farmers are, are, are the same, I think, is with AI. And there's a big misthinking that AI somehow is going to grow up and be like the Terminator or something like that. And the people who know that I've talked to and know about the tech, that general intelligence, they don't even know how to do it, much less when it will happen. OK, it won't look like Janesville. This is a book about um, factory closing in a small Wisconsin city called Janesville and all the misery that follows. It, it won the FT McKinsey Award in 2017. That's not how it's going to happen. There's going to be no unemployment rest belt style. There will be no factory closure and like everybody in the insurance building on the third floor has to go home. That's not the way it's going to come. It's going to come this way. You ever been at a table like that? Do you have rules about that at your tables? How many of you had rules at the family table? OK. How many obey your own rules? <laughs> um, so what I want to do is draw an analogy by the way the iPhone changed our lives and the way Globotics will change the world of work. So 10 years ago, when the iPhone first came out, or 10 years or so ago, it only did three things. And Steve Jobs was so keen that it could do all three. It was a great music player. It was a mediocre cell phone with a short battery life. And it was a web browser, which wasn't much good because there wasn't much Wi-Fi anywhere. And you couldn't plug it in to the ISDN lines. But one innovation at a time, one improvement at a time, it invaded our work lives. It invaded our social lives. It changed the way we interact with our cities, with maps and information. In essence, it completely changed the way we work. But nobody decided to let that happen. It just happened. We didn't even know it was happening for quite a few years because it was billions of seemingly small, unrelated changes which accumulated into a situation where we go like, how did we get along without them? And I can see people, there's some people here who share their barber tech, uh, preferences with me. So I know you lived in a world where when you came to Auckland or a new city, you had to get a map. And then you had to like try and figure out which way was north and you had to go around like that. Now, how would I ever go around a new city without Google Maps, for example? So that's the way I think this Globotics will come into our world of work. It won't be like, Joe and half the accounting department get fired. It's the accounting department gets somebody to come in online to help them with translation or coding or Excel little bits and pieces. And then they'll outsource another little bit of this or, or that. They'll automate another little bit of that. And you know maybe not even anybody in accounting will ha be, have to be fired. They just won't be replaced. Gradually, five or 10 years down the road, I think they will be pervasive in the workplace. And it's possible that people don't even see it as the trend that it's for. Number three, job displacement is the business model. Digitech is driving job displacement. Human ingenuity is driving job creation. That mismatch speed is the problem. I feel like I'm exhausting you guys, but I'm, I, no, OK. We well, could ask questions, too, if you want. Uh, that's one of the great things about a small audience. So to me, it's not the direction of travel. It's the mismatch speed. So the business model in AI is to displace jobs. Because if you want to become a billionaire in the next three to five years, what you do is gather a great big structured data set on what one kind of worker is doing right now. You estimate uh, through machine learning an algorithm that can do it. And you put it up, and you replace 10% of all the check-in people in Hilton. And other, you become a billionaire. You don't become a billionaire by creating new jobs. For one thing, it's not much structured data there, so it's much slower. And I think there's millions and millions of jobs to be created. Just the, for example, what AI is really augmenting the intelligence of average people. 
What's really different between this technology and the last is you don't have to be clever to use it. In fact, most of you are using it without knowing it. Spell checking is AI. Automatic translation in Outlook, that's AI. Optical character recognition, that's AI. It's so easy, you don't even know you're using it. My, my mother-in-law, for example, she uses natural language voice recognition on her phone because her fingers can't hit the buttons correctly. She did not take a course or read the instructions for that. It was just so easy to use. So what I think is happening, is potentially going to happen, is you take, let's say, diagnostic capacity in medicine or drafting in architecture or discovery in law. I think in most professions, the high end has been based on experience-based pattern recognition. Sometimes we call it judgment. And a lot of that judgment is just database pattern recognition. And if you can gather the data set, an AI will be able to do it much faster, much easier, very soon. But that means that some of the things that made the high-end architects and the lawyers and the doctors and the draftsmen and the engineer are now going to be accessible to average people. So I think there will be a huge immediate, intermediate level of jobs between a nurse and a doctor, between a draftsman and an architect, between an engineer and the road chief, where these guys, or women, can use the AI experience to do more than they can now. But nobody's going to become a billionaire creating those jobs, because we'd have to change the regulations. We'd have to change perceptions. We'd have to create the market. We'd have to change the regulatory framework in architecture and law and all that sort of thing, that won't happen in three to five years, so nobody's working on it. But it will come. Eventually, it will come. In, in the UK, for example, they're so pressed on uh, NHS and staff, as you probably read, they have too little of almost everything, and they decided to kick out a whole bunch of the ones they had. But so they are really into this, both remote intelligence and artificial intelligence. They have an app called Babylon Health. And it, you, you call it up and you give it your symptoms and it can make suggestions. And if you want to schedule a meeting with a GP, it does that as well. So it, it's there, and they've adopted it, not because they wanted to, but because they're desperate. People are clogging up the lines, calling the nurses about simple things. So the NHS has enabled this in-between app in order to create a, a workforce. And I think that will spread, okay. So future of globalization, let me go thra through this fast. Telemigration, I'm gonna go through the telemigration. It's gonna come, and I'll, I'll do, give you the short version of it. Services are where the largest price differences in the world are today. So a 20 to one price difference is quite common in professional services. Doctors, lawyers, accountants, judges, economics professors, in quite sophisticated countries, let's say the Philippines, the economics professors, or say lawyers trained in the British system in Kenya or South Africa, they will earn one-tenth or one-twentieth of what they do in London. Now, up to now, the companies couldn't exploit those price differences because of technological barriers. There are some legal barriers, but like, for instance, a lot of law work doesn't need a lawyer. Lots and lots of the background work could be done. You do need a British admitted to the bar lawyer at the end of the whole process, but a lot of that back, back stuff could be offshored. And it wasn't because of technological barriers. Think about it like a 1,000% tariff on services. And digital technology is every two years cutting that in half. So going down to 500%, then 250%, then 125%. Every two years, it's cutting in half. So our companies will start to arbitrage those differences through telemigration. Now, it will never be as good to have a remote foreigner working in your office compared to a domestic in place. But it'll be a whole lot cheaper. So what do you think is going to happen? In fact, it's already happening with domestic telecommuting. It's just domestic telecommuting going forward. So I'll skip uh, some of these other ones. The Star Trek was one of my favorite, but we don't have time for that. Just want to ask, how many of you have seen Star Trek? 
the original series. How many of you saw it on a TV? How many of you know what a TV is? <laughs> Not enough young people in the crowd for that to be funny, but anyways. <laughs> so what I want to argue is that we're facing a talent tsunami in the service sector. In some sense, the story of globalization in the 1990s was hundreds of millions of low-cost foreigners joining the manufacturing workforce. And it completely changed the reality of making stuff in rich countries. What we're doing now is in the 2020s to see hundreds of millions of low-cost, talented foreigners joining the service workforce. Not all at once, but gradually and progressively. And I think it will change the service sector as much as it changed the manufacturing sector. OK, so now, now I come to the happy part. My, my publisher uh, told me the book had to have a happy ending, because it's a trade, trade book. And I go, happy ending? This doesn't sound like a happy ending, does it, to you? And I search my mind. And then I actually think, now I totally believe it's going to have a happy ending. And, and so I'll, I'll come to that now. The good news is jobs will appear as they have before. Now, I'm, I'm, that's the future. We, maybe they won't, but they have before. We've had two great big transformations of the economy, where we went from farms to factories and from factories to offices. Each time, hundreds of millions of jobs were created doing things that we did no idea we needed or could use. And I'm quite confident that although we can't name them, there'll be hundreds of millions of jobs created. They'll be in the service sector, but they'll be sheltered from RI and AI. Jobs which RI can't do and jobs which AI can't do. So when we think about the world of work, we have to use a process of elimination. Future jobs, we can't know their names, but we can understand what they'll be like through a process of elimination. Here it is. Globots will do what they can. We will do what Globots can't. So then the question is, what can't Globots do? And I, I hope I've got you there with the Globots, like robots go together. That, that's exactly why I wanted to talk about Globots. OK, so the, what can't AI do? So a lot of people have studied the AI and what it can do. One of my favorite reports is by McKinsey Global Institute called A Future That Works. And what they did was, a U, based on the US uh, data, they broke down the task in the US jobs. There's, in the US BLS, there's about 800 jobs with a detailed description of each one. And you, you can code that all up, and you find the task. And McKinsey divided that into eight things. There's seven of them listed here, because it's relevant to services. So predictable physical activities, processing data, collecting data, unpredictable physical activities, interfacing with stakeholders, applying expertise, managing and developing people. And the red shows you what percentage of time in America are spent on each of those activities. And the blue is the share of those tasks which can be automated with current AI. Not that they are automated, but could be if everybody catches up to speed. And I've ordered them in order of decreasing. Now, if you squint your eyes and say, what's common about the stuff on the bottom, I would like to say it's the most human task. It's empathy, creativity, dealing with people, managing groups of people, curiosity, ethics, things like this that humans do and the current AI can't do. And in particular, Let's think about why can't, oh, here, that's in, it's online. It's a, it, the report is, is, is quite good, has lots of, other, lots of other graphs. Why can't AI do human? So the reason, in my mind, is machine learning is a jet fuel, but big data, is, sorry, machine learning is a jet engine, but big data is a jet fuel. So if you can't get a big data set, we can't automate it. So then the question is, which task can't be structured, captured with a big structured data set. So look at your own job, it's like a to-do list. Some of the things you do, the question or task is clear, and the outcome is clear. So you, you, know, you, you go through your emails and decide what they are. That's a clear task, and the outcome is fairly clear. So you could gather a large data set on it. But other parts of your job, especially service jobs, it's not at all clear what the question is or what you're doing. And it's sometimes difficult to determine whether you did it well or not 
in real time. Meetings is my favorite. Go to faculty meetings, there is an agenda, but after two hours you go like, what were we doing? <laughs> what was the issue? And then you go like, what did we decide? I, there's a minutes afterwards, but that process was not a structured data set. Because what we have to sit down and as a faculty discuss and share, that's a human process that you can't get structured data on. And many things like, are like that, especially human interactions. We have uh, incredible social intelligence. That's our, our key, I, 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 the whole part about evolutionary psychology in the book. And computers can't do that. So I think there's a reason that computers can't do the most human things. So then the question is, what can't RI do? Now these really are humans, and they can do anything you can, probably for cheaper, except one thing. They can't be in the same room. And there are some of your tasks which require you to be face-to-face -face with humans or with machines, or at least it's way more uh, productive to be face together, face to face. If you want to do some preliminary investigations of customers and stuff, you can do that by email, maybe even Skype. But if you want to close a $10 million deal, you better be face to face, probably with a glass of wine in your hands, talking, so you really understand each other establishing trust. You can't do that with a freelancer from the Philippines. So there will be some parts of your job which cannot be done by telemigrants. So this is the long run future of work. More human, more local jobs. Because everything else will be done by the AI or the RI. Now I don't know what those jobs will be, but the tasks that will be required are more human skills, more interpersonal skills, softer skills than they are now. And it will involve things where you're actually together with people. Uh, if, if you're telecommuting to work a few days a week, you are doing things which are likely to be replaced by telemigrants relatively quickly. So uh, don't do that, or at least uh, don't spend a lot of time acquiring it. Also, don't spend a lot of time acquiring a second language badly. Anyways, machine translation. So this is the message I want to, I'm going way over time, but we're having fun, or at least I was having fun. Um, this is a basic message in an infographic. Digital technology is launching automation and globalization at the same time, affecting white collar and professional jobs faster than most think and in ways few expect. And that's what globotics is. I want you to think really, there's three or four really different things here. Once, the last time computerization started around 1970, the new globalization didn't start until about 1990. So we had two decades of adjustment to automation in the factories before we hit China, which amplified the whole thing. And in the first one, we had 100 years between the beginning of the industrialization, industrial revolution and mechanization or automation, and then globalization picking up in 1820 at the big time. This time, they both started more or less in 2016. The, the freelancing is, is growing at an incredible pace, and the robotic process automation is, and the other ones are growing at an incredible pace. So I'm going to just stop right there and thank you for listening. <laughs>